I want to thank you all for coming to our 20th lecture of the Phyllis and George Halburn Radio Astronomy Lecture Series. We are extremely grateful for uh, this family for their continued support of this program, as well as the chair of our department who has really provided the funding for videotaping this lecture series. Um, these lecture series actually are all on, on our department website, so you can actually view them. Um, today uh, we have a treat, um, and it is really with great pleasure that I want to introduce uh, Vicky Caspi, um, Professor of Physics, uh, McGill University, and uh, also the Lorne Trottier Chair in Astrophysics and Cosmology, and a Canada Research Chair in Observational Astrophysics. She is uh, originally from Texas. <laughs> she actually lived also in Skokie yeah. for, for, I don't know how long, a couple of years. Two maybe. years in Skokie, yeah. Two, Two Skokie years in Texas. When she was a little. And then uh, she went to McGill crazy, to do her undergraduate story. work. And after McGill, um, she went to Princeton uh, to do her thesis work with Joe Taylor, as you know. Joe works on pulsars and they got a Nobel Prize for it. So, and then uh, for her postdoc, she went to Caltech, uh, JPL, and then MIT, and then eventually landed at uh, McGill again, uh, now as a faculty member. And she's been there since 2000. Um, Vicky's work really is mainly about uh, radio and x ray techniques to study neutron stars, uh, magnetars, pulsars, anything that is compact and you cannot map in the sky. So this is <laughs> what uh, she's been really working on over the years. Uh, among many discoveries that she made was the discovery of a pulsar at the center of G11 uh, minus 0.3, it's a supernova remnant, and she was able to actually associate this pulsar with the supernova remnant. And this being the second pulsar association with a supernova remnant. And that really strengthened the case <coughs> for supernova remnants and, and pulsars. I think there are not many of them anyways. Uh, this was actually a groundbreaking work in terms of really making the association um, between a pulsar and a supernova remnant. Vicky <coughs> uh, has uh, been really the recipient of numerous awards and honors. Um, to just name a few, uh, Killian Prize of the Canada Council for the Arts in 2015, the 2016 Gerhard Herzberg Medal, uh, Canada's top science prize. She's a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and a fellow of the American Physical Society, just naming a few. Uh, she is an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and in 2017, uh, Wiki was invested as companion to the Order of Canada, Canada's second highest civilian honor. So let's have a, a warm uh, round of applause for her, and thank you again for coming here and her busy schedule. Well, thank you all uh, for having me. It's uh, really nice to be here. Can everybody hear me well? Okay, good. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about fast radio bursts. So I, it's true, I, I used to work on, um, on neutron stars, and now I tell people I, I don't know if I still work on neutron stars. <laughs> uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. I understand that you recently had a talk on FRBs. A show of hands, how many uh, were at that talk? <laughs> okay. Well, look, I'm, uh, I think that's great, and you'll be primed. You can ask me really challenging uh, questions. Um, so, uh, mystery object. We don't, you know, the, the punchline for the moment is that we don't know what these are. Um, for those of you who are not there, um, fast radio bursts, it's a phenomenon discovered in 2007. They consist of very short bursts of radio waves, uh, short meaning few milliseconds typically. Uh, it was first identified using the Parkes Radio Telescope, which is pictured here, by Lorimer et al. Um, at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. 
this is um, this is what they observed. This is a classic fast radio burst. Probably you've seen this before. Uh, time on the x-axis, radio frequency on the y-axis going from 1.2 to 1.5 gigahertz. Uh, this is a local TV station. Just ignore that. <laughs> but the the burst is sweeping through the band. You can see it's arriving at high radio frequency before low radio frequency. That's dispersion in the ionized interstellar and we'll discuss what else medium. Uh, and the inset is, is the, the, if you sum it up, if you align correct for this dispersion, you get uh, that signal there. And, and once it goes off, it's gone. So this, this has never been seen, this source has not been seen again. Um, today there's been, so it's, the first one was in 2007, since then there's been uh, 60, 60 FRBs published. Um, they're not microwave ovens, and I'll explain very briefly why I say that. Um, and in spite of the fact that since 2007 there's only been 60 published, we believe that the sky rate is very high. So every day, if you could look at the whole sky, you would detect roughly a thousand of these events. So it's something that is ubiquitous in the universe. It's not uncommon. Um, we, as I'll explain, and we probably know they're extragalactic. We, we strongly believe they're extragalactic and probably, in fact, at cosmological distances. Uh, and we do not know their origin. So the reason, uh, so when I talk about dispersion, the time delay from one radio frequency to another goes, it's a, it's a little, if you look carefully, that's a parabola, it goes as 1 over frequency squared. And that constant of proportionality there called the dm, um, that's you know, the degree, how much dispersion there is, something that is um, 0 dm would just come all at the same time. That d dispersion measure is proportional to the integrated electron density along the line of sight. And this phenomenon, this dispersive phenomenon, is, is observed ubiquitously for uh, radio pulsars in our galaxy. In fact, it's how we infer distances. Um, we infer distances for radio pulsars using a model for the uh, free electron column density in our galaxy. And here's um, one visualization of that model. If you're looking down on a spiral galaxy like, like the Milky Way, here's the galactic center, and here's uh, Earth. The contours, and you can see it's sort of cartoon spiral arms, the contours are lines of constant dispersion measure. So that uh, for a galactic source, you know, lo located in some direction, if you measure the dispersion measure and, and you just measure that degree of slope, you can infer the distance, you know, assuming this model's correct. And that's what we do for radio pulsars very commonly. Uh, but the important point for this talk is that in any direction, and it's of course, it, it is a three-dimensional model. This is just two-dimensional projection on, of the galactic plane, but it's a totally three-dimensional model. In any direction, there's a maximum that the galaxy can yield in terms of dispersion measure, because the galaxy eventually runs out of electrons. And so if you observe something in some direction, and it's beyond the maximum, that's very suggestive that it's not in our galaxy. So the maximum? It, so it very strongly depends on direction and on galactic latitude. So if you look, uh, so this is actually the, yeah, so you can see a, a thousand. In fact, we know of the galactic center magnetar where the DM is mm -hmm. over a thousand. So this model is, it's been, this is a, this must be not exactly galactic latitude <coughs> zero. This must be a slice that's a little higher galactic latitude. But um, the maximum we know is just under 2,000. But if you go, perpendicular to the galactic plane. It's as low as 30, 25 in some directions. And so the Lorimer burst, discovered with the Parkes telescope uh, in 2007, the maximum dispersion measure in its direction due to our galaxy from this model, which by the way is, is fairly well calibrated because we have pulsars, many of, not, some of which have independent distance estimates through supernova remnant associations and through uh, some Pulsars are in binaries, and you can see how far away their companion is. Uh, so the distance model is pretty well calibrated. The maximum uh, due to the galaxy along this line of sight was 25 in the arcane parsecs per centimeter cube units of dispersion measure, 
whereas the burst dispersion measure was 375. So it's over an order of magnitude greater than what could be provided by the galaxy. So that's why you say, oh, well, that must be extragalactic. Um, now, I'll get back to that, but there was a little side story I was going to tell you very quickly that Parkes started finding a few of these things and um, different dispersion measures, and some of them looked a little strange. Some of them didn't have a perfect sweep. They were kind of clumpy. Um, they had um, other anomalies that I, I won't get into, but some of them looked a little different, and they noted the difference between the Lorimer type bursts and what they started to call paratons, and they plotted um, the arrival by time of day, where the, the dark ones are the Lorimer type bursts, and the light gray ones are the paratons, which looked a little strange. And they noticed that the stranger ones tended to arrive at lunchtime at the local site, and that's, you know, suspicious. And um, it turned out that you can produce something like this when you open a microwave oven prematurely, and the telescope is pointed roughly in the direction of the microwave oven. So there's a visitor center at the park site uh, it has a microwave oven, and um, you know, if you're really impatient and you open the door of the microwave oven before it stops, it produces a periton. And so that's why um, these were uh, at lunchtime. But uh, once they figured that out and they shielded that microwave oven, the um, typical, more typical um, FRBs um, were, you know, there was no explanation for those. And they came at all times of the day, which is what you expect. Um, and by the way, they actually published this in monthly notices. If you read the abstract there, um, subsequent tests revealed the uh, peritons generated when a microwave door. I mean, this is this is monthly notices. I'm, the microwave door is opened. I thought this was brilliant of them, just wonderful. Um, anyway, getting back to the Lorimer burst, uh, the DM of 375. So, what does that mean? So, there's models for the intergalactic medium that predict, roughly speaking, that there should be some very tenuous plasma there. These are models. There's no observational constraints on this. And roughly speaking, these models predict, and, and there's a few different models, and the numbers are, you know, they're not always exactly the same, but roughly speaking, the DM, that column depth of electrons in the IGM, should scale with redshift by, uh, if you do the units right, 1,200 times Z, sorry, Z, uh, is um, the DM. And so if you plug in the Lorimer burst dispersion measure after subtracting off the gal galactic contribution, that implies a redshift of 0.3, which is, you know, cosmological, um, which would correspond to roughly a gigaparsec. Um, but likely that's an upper limit because some DM must be in the host galaxy, so the total DM is the sum of the Milky Way contribution, the IGM contribution, and something from the host. Uh, and so let's say you just uh, d say the distance is, okay, it's half a gigaparsec. That corresponds to uh, an energy release of 10 to the 40 ergs, or a luminosity of 10 to the 43 ergs per second, just to set the energy scale. Uh, so something is, you know, it's a lot of energy. Now you might say, well, why don't you just go and look and see, is there a galaxy where it came from? So the problem is that's the Parkes beam. It's diffraction limited, radio astronomy, diffraction limited, and there's a thousand galaxies there that it could be. You can't do it. And let's say even if you detected one using Arecibo, much bigger aperture, smaller beam, still hopeless, lots of galaxies there, you can't do it. What you really need is an interferometer to do this. So if you had the VLA, but the problem is VLA is not very good at finding these things, and once they go off, in principle, they're gone. Uh, so DLA doesn't have a field of view. You need, so it's a telescope that can localize really well, can't, can't detect, at least today that's true. Um, no doubt Vikram told you about his um, planned telescope that um, could in principle detect an interesting number and localize them, but we'll get back to that. Um, so models, what could these be? Um, up until recently there were definitely more models than there were events. Uh, the source size 
uh, for a millisecond implies a compact object, you know, 300 kilometers or less. The energy is not that constraining. 10 to the 43 ergs per second, oh, that's a high number, but it's not, uh, or 10 to the 40 ergs, uh, certainly nothing compared to gamma ray burst. Puny. Uh, and by the way, you might wonder, are there FRB, GRB coincidences? And uh, po McGill, postdoc, Sriash, Tendulkar checked, and no, they don't seem to be. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, it could be that we're seeing FRBs much further away than we can see GRBs. I don't know. We could discuss that. Um, for FRBs, uh, there's easily enough energy in a cataclysmic event. So maybe you want it to be a supernova, uh, but it's hard. It, it's not, you, you could imagine that, but very early on in the supernova, you'd expect high opacity to radio waves. It's, it's hard to have it uh, not be absorbed um, early on. You might think, well, what about like a neutron star, neutron star merger? Um, but we're seeing 1,000 per sky per day. You know, and that's above current thresholds. If we went down lower thresholds, you'd probably see more. You know, that doesn't, that, that's a huge rate. Um, one thing we can say for certain is that the radiation mechanism must be coherent. Uh, argument that has been applied for years to radio pulsars. The size of the object is really small. If you just apply the Planck function in the Rally genes limit, um, take the implied radius, and calculate what brightness temperature, you know, it's 10 to the 30-something Kelvin. So you need some sort of coherent process to get that kind of uh, brightness temperature. And it suggests, you know, strong magnetic fields are involved. One, one quick question in association with gamma ray bursts. So um, obviously the rate is too high for gamma ray bursts too. Uh, even with beaming, uh, it's still too high, right? But I, I guess you, do you, you have to split up the gamma ray bursts. There's different types of gamma ray bursts. Yeah. Um, there could be different types of FRBs, which I'm about to get yeah. to. Okay. I think there's interesting conversations there, but okay. it's hard to say. So um, I'm going to skip this slide and just go on to this slide. So s searching for FRBs until fairly recently has been done with single-dish radio telescopes. And they've been found as a byproduct of surveys that were actually designed to look for radio pulsars. Uh, and two of those surveys were ones I was involved in. Uh, one was with the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, 305 meter reflector. Um, we were doing a survey of only the galactic plane using a multi-beam receiver, seven beam P-alpha receiver at a center frequency of 1.4 gigahertz and with a bandwidth of 300 megahertz. And also we were using the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia uh, to do a survey of the full Green Bank sky. And this is also for radio pulsars, but at a center frequency of 350 megahertz. So I just want to tell you briefly the results of these surveys, because in particular, Arecibo found one very interesting FRB. Um, I'll skip that. Um, this is uh, the first FRB found by Arecibo. In fact, I say the first, but we only found two. <laughs> we got incredibly lucky. Um, you can see the dis telltale dispersion sweep there, although interestingly it seems to fade at lower frequencies. That sort of puzzled us, but it's clearly a 1 over F squared effect. It was the first non-Parks FRB, so that was quite exciting because we were, everybody was a little worried that maybe it was something in their software, but it wasn't. The dispersion measure was 558, about three, to three times, not 10 times, but three times the maximum along the galaxy. And we noted the strange spectrum, which implied a positive spectral index of plus nine, which is weird in radio astronomy, as you probably know. And we just assumed that this weird spectrum was due to being offset in the beam. And let me explain what I mean. What do you say about the spectrum that's weird? Uh, like, can you see oh, that it's okay. rising. So it gets brighter at higher frequency. That's not very typical of radio sources. Uh, so at the focus of Arecibo um, in, that, uh, in that dome that's, that's suspended hundreds of feet above the surface, this is a picture of the um, aperture of the P-alpha receiver, seven beam receiver. And the beam pattern on the sky uh, looks, this, this is what, what the sky sees of the so you have seven independent beams on the sky. And um, 
you know, they're diffraction limited, and so d depending on the spectrum of your source, uh, you're going to detect a, a different spectrum if it's not at the center of one of the beams. And so this is a map of if you were to put in a perfectly flat spectrum source, so equal amount of light at all frequencies, what spectral index would you measure? And so we said we measured plus 9. And you see there, you know, there are some gray bits. There is some phase space for being able to get a, spectra, a spectral index of plus 9 from a flat spectrum source if, you happen to, if it happens to have arrived in sort of a first side lobe of the side beams. And so that's what we had assumed it was. And we were totally wrong. So the big shock was when we went back to that site and we looked at it again because we felt we should do due diligence, even though none of the park's FRBs had ever been seen to repeat. And to our amazement, after taking lots and lots of data and seeing nothing, this graduate student, Paul Schultz, was diligent. He said, I'm going to process all the data. And nobody else really wanted to because we weren't going to see anything, of course. And then one day, 10 bursts in the span of a few hours. We were shocked. We were shocked. Um, and so there are the bursts. And this time, they've been pre dispersed They were all at the same dispersion measure, so clearly from the same source. Some were incredibly bright. Some were incredibly dim. Some had strong positive spectra, spectral indexes. Some had strong negative spectral indexes. The spectrum was wagging around. Um, and because the telescope was fixed at one position, it couldn't be because the source was changing location in the beam. It had to be intrinsic to the source. And immediately we thought, gosh, what is that? And we, I mean, we're still saying, gosh, what is that? We don't know. You know, we had observed it many, many times and not seen anything. And subsequent studies of the repeater, of the Arecibo repeater, have shown that the repeats are incredibly clustered. This is not a Poissonian process. We can say that with certainty. This is a plot that's showing um, MJD on the y-axis, going uh, spanning um, 1,500 days, more than 1,500 days, several years. And these are length of observations at the different epochs. This is one hour, three hours. And the dots are where we detected events. So you can see the very first event was here. And we had taken lots of data looking for it again, never seen anything. And this is, but this is, you know, Paul Schultz being really diligent. And then there's the new, the, there were all the bursts that we saw. And then since then, there were a few, and then nothing. And then look at that burst storm. Okay, zooming in, I mean, just hundreds of bursts. It just goes on, goes off. You, you don't, it's and very unpredictable. The spectra just go crazy on time scales of less than an hour? Yeah, I mean, it's actually, um, these two bursts are, um, I think, 20 seconds apart. I'm just telling you what we observe. I, I can't explain it. You must be wrong. <laughs> Sorry. We're, and so we're not wrong. And, and I, I mean, we now, so I'm presenting it as if it's shocking, but what I know now is that uh, it's common. Like, so I don't know why. What but. about polarization? Ah, uh, yes. Um, so these observations were not sensitive to polarization, but subsequent observations were. Uh, I can't remember if I, I think I did not include slides on it, but I can tell you. Uh, it is 100% linearly polarized. And this source, the rotation measure has been measured. And it's 10 to the 5 in standard rotation measure units, one of the highest rotation measures ever measured for any astronomical source. Uh, the only one that I know of that's comparable in rotation measure is the magnetar at the center of the galaxy. Sag A star. Yeah, and Sag A star. Okay, I, I think I forgot to put a slide in, but thank you for asking, because that's another weird thing about it. Um, so, now there's, um, for a long time, there was only one repeater, even though people were starting to find more and more FRBs, and you might say, why only one repeater? Are there different classes of FRBs? Uh, some 
are cataclysmic, some are not. Um, we noticed that the repeat bursts were actually a little wider. The, the, the Arecibo repeaters bursts were a little wider than the Parks burst. We, I mean, we didn't know what to make of that, but that's true. Uh, but then we also thought, is it a coincidence that of the at the time, so this changes to 60, sorry, at the time uh, that, that of 60 known, the only repeater was also the only Arecibo burst. Arecibo's the most ten- much more sensitive than Parks. And many of the repeat bursts in the repeater would not be detected by Parks. So it could be others are repeaters too, and um, you just can't see them. Now, what could the repeater be? We don't know. Uh, we can use our imaginations to guess. It could be a rotation-powered pulsar, like the ones we have in the, ga- in the galaxy, w- uh, showing giant pulses. The crab pulsar, the famous crab pulsar, has giant pulses, um, although given that the dispersion measure implies a cosmological distance, the luminosity is a factor of a million or maybe even a billion different. So even though the crab giant pulses are are really bright, they're so bright that if you knew when to look on your television, if you didn't have cable and you had an old-fashioned antenna, you would see a spark of static. It's really bright. But it's in the galaxy. The crab giant pulses are puny in luminosity compared to FRBs. Uh, Or you might think, well, what about a magnetar? You're looking for a compact object with a lot of energy. Magnetars have giant flares in X-rays and gamma rays, but not really in radio. But those are nice sources of energy. And just coming to the, you know, thinking a little bit more about crab giant pulses, um, the maximum luminosity is 10 to the 35 ergs per second. And I already told you that we're at 10 to the 43 ergs per second uh, for the Lorimer burst and, and for other FRBs too, if you believe the dispersion measures. But um, there's some, nevertheless, there's some phenomena that are seen in the crab giant pulses that are interesting in this context. Now, admittedly, this is between 8 and 10 gigahertz, and this is time in microseconds. Uh, but this is a giant pulse in you know, a few microseconds wide. And you can see there's interesting spectral structure there, these striations. This is observations by Hankins and Eilek. Now, we don't know what that's due to in the crab pulsar, but it's been observed for a long time. And interesting spectral structure, well, that sounds interesting. Um, it also has nanostructure, so you might think that if you could observe FRBs with very high time resolution, maybe you would see nano shots like you see in the crab. Uh, but the problem with it is energetics. So radio pulsars are uh, their e dot, their spin, their, their luminosity is powered by the rate of loss of rotational kinetic energy. Um, and so the crab pulsar, so so you can relate the rate of loss of rotational kinetic energy to you assume a neutron star moment of inertia and the spin down rate and the period. The crab pulsar's period is 33 milliseconds. We know its spin down rate. Its luminosity is 5 times 10 to the 38 ergs per second. That's not enough for the repeater. You, you can't, it's, it's <coughs> orders of magnitude too small. Now maybe you want to Oh, it goes as 1 over p cubed. Maybe you want to make p really small. You want a millisecond magnetar. Maybe you could, you could just play with the parameters for rotation power. You, could, you have to fine tune them, and you have to get them to real extremes. Uh, it's pretty hard to accomplish that. Um, pros of FRBs is magnetars. Um, magnetars have giant flares. Uh, with few millisecond peaks in the X-rays and gamma rays. This, this, we've observed three of those, actually, um, since 1979. One was in the Magellanic Cloud, so ignore that. Well, actually, I counted that. Um, but uh, that implies a rate of about 0.1 per Milky Way uh, per year. Uh, but FRBs, if you think about it a little deeper, uh, it's a much smaller rate per galaxy per year. Um, so the rates don't seem to match with what we know about giant flares, quite apart from the fact that giant flares don't seem to make giant radio bursts. They make X-ray bursts. Uh, nevertheless, magnetars have sufficient energy. 
Um, now you might say whether if you're seeing 10 giant flares in an hour from Arecibo with two separated by 10 seconds that, you know, it doesn't smell like the magnetars we know of in our galaxy, that's for sure. But there's an energy reservoir, I can't, can't argue with that, that could, that could supply the energy. Maybe if they're really young magnetars, you know, maybe they're a magnetar when it's first born is incredibly active and likes to emit radio bursts, I don't know. Um, But energetically speaking, it it can't last for more than about a hundred or maybe a few hundred years. Uh, It would eat up most of that reservoir. So if this repeater, if we come back a hundred years, it's still boom, boom, booming. It's, you know, it's it's hard to imagine. But, yeah. Can I ask the repeating one, or at least the one you have talked about? Yeah. Um, The luminosity, was it detected marginally? Or could we have seen repeat uh, bursts that were fainter? And then is the distribution of these repeating bursts, luminosity-wise, um, all, P, all at the same, is it, is it a, a peak luminosity distribution? It's a power law. It's a power law. Yes. So, so, it, so my question, I guess, it is the ones we don't see to repeat, could it be because we're just not seeing the faint ones? Yes. I think so. Um, so um, eventually we got, we got around to getting some VLA time. Once you have a repeating source, then you have a chance to go to an interferometer and localize the position like I showed you before. And then you have a host of a host. You have a chance of identifying the host. So this was done. Now this is um, computationally very demanding, and it's Casey Law, Sarah Burke Spoler, and and their collaborators who set up a system called RealFast that can do this kind of fast sampling, fast high frequency resolution. You need for frequency resolution because you have to correct for dispersion. It's non-trivial with the VLA, but they they set it up, and we got time. And in the fall of 2015, we sat for 10 hours and didn't see anything. And then the spring of 2016, we sat for 40 hours, and we didn't see anything, and the VLA was trying to get annoyed with us. Um, but, uh, you know, don't give up. We knew it had to be there. And in the fall of 2016, they gave us, they said, it's your last chance. Um, they gave us more time. And in the first, first hour of a test observation, um, boom, it went off. And this is one of, so the, the circle, uh, circles were the Arecibo error positions. Uh, we had done some gridding, uh, so we knew it was in the overlap region. And, and for arcane reasons, it has this, in the VLA data, it looks like the star, and it was right where we knew it would be. And indeed, it was dispersed at exactly the same dispersion measure as Arecibo had detected. So we knew we had seen the, the right source. And it wasn't just one event. Um, we actually got nine bursts. Uh, at, with the VLA and always from the same position, always at the same dispersion measure. And we could localize it to 0.1 arc seconds at that point. And one of the, so we had that, um, which then the next thing, the, the next thing you go to optical telescope. But before that, we noticed there's a persistent radio source at the position of the burster. So there's the burster that likes to go off and on, but there's also something always permanently a persistent radio source. And you can see the radio flux density from that persistent source, variable, it's variable. Uh, uh, 30% variability, it's uh, mean is about 200 microjansky, so it's not a very bright persistent source, but it's there and it's variable, and the variability, the little red triangles are where we saw bursts. And you see it's not, doesn't seem to be very obviously correlated with the flux of the persistent source. Um, so that's a curious thing. That some, what is that persistent source? Uh, but more importantly, well, not more importantly, also important is that we went and saw a 25th magnitude optical counterpart. And this was done with the Gemini telescope. Uh, and it turns out there is a dwarf galaxy there. So that was another surprise. We weren't expecting a dwarf galaxy. We just, I thought it was going to be a spiral galaxy. But nope, it's a dwarf at about a gigaparsec. Uh, you know, so, sort of as everything predicted, like uh, if you, you ha- some people were questioning if we were interpreting dispersion measures right, but no, we were. Uh, so redshift is 0.2, and um, the mass 
of this galaxy is about uh, 5 times 10 to the 7 solar masses. Um, if the Milky Way were at redshift point 0.2, it would be about this size. So it's, it's clearly a very puny little galaxy, you know, Magellanic Cloud class dwarf galaxy. Uh, it has a, a low metallicity, but a high uh, star formation. And, um, and low metallicity, you mean half a tenth? Or um, let me see if I, I don't remember if I have it. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. It might be in a couple of slides. Um, so at the time, we got quite a bit of press about this. I'll just, um, this was the New York Times, who said, radio burst traced a faraway galaxy, but color is probably ordinary physics. <laughs> and I really thought, like, I'd like to bring one to his home at <laughs> night and explode it and see how ordinary he finds it. Um, but, um, he meant not said it. yeah, I don't know what he, yeah, it, that's probably what he meant. But curiously, across the, across the city at the New York Post, um, <laughs> uh, I, I can't explain that headline. Okay, I just don't know. Did you say that? What? Did you say that? Did I? No, of course not. <laughs> no, of course we didn't say that. I can imagine who might have said it, but I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> anyway, once you can do interferometry, you might as well go for a very long baseline interferometry. And um, we got European VLBI network, EVN, and VLBA data. Oh, excuse me, I had a, oh. the intergalactic dispersion was most of the dispersion. Uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's um, remember, our SIBO was surveying the galactic planes, so the DM, it's about a third, a third, a third. It's a third Milky Way, a third IGM, and a third host, we think. If, if you believe the standard, um, we don't now that, uh, we don't know exactly how much is in the host. And that's just going to be an eternal problem in this field. I mean, it, you're hitting on something that's really fundamentally interesting. Uh, I haven't said it, but you, know, you have these short bursts of radio waves coming from cosmological distances. They, they have the potential to be powerful cosmological probes. Um, of the uh, baryon contact, uh, content of intergalactic magnetic fields, the evolution of them, of um, epoch of reionization. There's all sorts of things you can imagine doing with them. You could, might be able to constrain dark energy through gravita gravitational lensing uh, by looking for uh, multiple, you know, this, uh, one burst lens. Like this, uh, there's a whole host of things you could do with them um, that do require you know the host galaxy dispersion measure. And that, I don't know how we're ever going to know. Anyway, um, we did join these, these observations. We got few milliarc second resolutions. We got four bursts with the EVN uh, observing with Arecibo at the same time. And we know that the bursting source is coincident to within 40 parsecs with the radio continuum source. So they're the same thing. Or at least, they, they may not be the same object, but they are um, somehow physically related. Uh, and we got HST observations um, that show that the location of the burster and the continuum radio source is coincident with a knot of star formation. So that sort of feels like a very young object. It's sort of maybe magnetar-like, but I mean, I'm, I'm telling you what we know. Yeah. Sorry, so you said that it's a maximum of 40 parsec separation, but you can't say that there's a minimum separation or that they aren't separated from one another. That's right? true. Okay. That's true. But it's a, at most a 40 parsec separation. But they could be directly coincident. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so where do we stand? There's at least one fast radio burst that's definitely cosmological. Okay, that's uh, the repeater. But is it representative? Um, we don't know what the bursting source is. We don't know what the persistent source is. It is true, um, and you could get, you know, th there's this class of supernova called superluminous supernovae that are frequently coincident with dwarf, low metallicity, high star formation rate dwarf galaxies. So 
they, does that mean they're related phenomena? I don't know. I'm just, again, telling you um, what people have thought of. I, this is like we could have a whole talk just on, on that question. So there's question? no correlation between the variable source, variable persistent source, and the, um, and the bursts. Right, yeah. So we see bursts. It doesn't seem to affect the, the brightness of the continuum source. They, they seem to be coincident, so within 40 parsecs, but it doesn't get brighter when the source is active or dimmer. Yes? What's the spectrum of the persistent source? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I don't remember now. But it's in our paper. I could I could look it up for you. I don't remember. Does the, is the persistent source looking like anything we know? Like, uh, could it be? Uh, oh, like a, a, a it, it, so as a supernova remnant. Oh, uh, as a super well, it's variable for one thing. So a supernova remnant doesn't seem like variable, but it's also way too luminous to be a supernova remnant. Yeah. It, it's orders of magnitude too luminous. But could it be the center of the, the galaxy? Oh, like an AGN yeah. or something? Um, that is possible. Low luminosity that is AGN. possible. And, and then there's a whole conversation one has with dwarf galaxy experts about whether or not they have supermassive black holes. Yeah. I think people don't know. But as I mentioned, and, and, and thank you for asking the question about polarization, it also has this whopping rotation measure, and it's in a constant. So it does, maybe it, it is AGN related. Although you should invite Brian Metzger, and he has a lovely model which I could I would love to tell you all about, but I want to talk about something else instead. But you could ask about it after. Um, I mentioned that we had been doing surveys for FR for radio pulsars and FRBs. I mentioned too, Arecibo found the repeater. We were also doing a Green Bank survey at a much lower radio frequency of 350 megahertz, and we looked for FRBs and. Um, it's actually a PhD student from McGill, Pragya Chala, there she is, uh, who looked and found nothing. So she looked and looked. She was really diligent, worked really hard on this, and didn't find a single event where we had thought we would find a dozen. And so that was a little puzzling. The rate versus radio frequency. There's many observed at 1.4 gigahertz. Um, there actually have been several observed at eight, at the time. There were several observed at 800 megahertz, and in GBNCC there were none observed at 350 megahertz. And so, why do they disappear? Wouldn't it be nice to have a really sensitive FRB search in the 400 to 800 megahertz range? Somehow they're disappearing. That's a really interesting place to search. And you might say, well, you you might not see very many. Their spectra could just fall off. Um, they could be absorbed. Free free absorption is stronger at lower frequencies. If you think they're coming from some dense supernova or something, maybe their emission is absorbed. Or maybe they're scattered so that a millisecond burst is actually scattered to be much longer. Just to remind you, scattering of radio waves, it's multipath scattering. Basically, you have in homogeneities in your in electron density distribution, and a, a radio wave that might have gone somewhere else gets scattered back into your line of sight. Very frequency-dependent effect, and what you see is the emitted pulse might have been nice and narrow, but you detect it with a scattering tail. Uh, and this is an example. It's actually, this is the galactic center magnetar, where you can see at very high radio frequencies, the pulse is nice and narrow, but you see it gets much broader at, as you get to lower frequency, and you see that by a gigahertz, that object is totally scattered away, very hard to see. So that could happen to FRBs as well. Um, so it could be you wouldn't see very many in 400 to 800 megahertz if you had that opportunity, and fortunately we do have that opportunity. So um, now I'm going to tell you about a radio telescope that we have recently built in Canada called CHIME. CHIME is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And the name clearly demonstrates that it was designed to do hydrogen mapping. 
Um, high redshift hydrogen mapping, so it's sensitive in the 400 to 800 megahertz range, so it's redshifted H1. Um, the idea was to map it in, in um, the redshift range 0.8 to 2.5 to study dark energy, baryon acoustic oscillations. And so it was designed to do that, but it turns out that the same design that is very useful for mapping hydrogen in the distant universe is fantastic in principle for finding fast radio bursts if they're in this wavelength band. So this is a picture of CHIME. It's located in Penticton, British Columbia. It consists of four cylindrical paraboloids. Each is 20 meters by 100 meters. So I like to say in Canadian units it has the collecting area of five hockey arenas. <laughs> You know, you're in Chicago, so I know, but you, Chicago didn't do very well, but oh. neither did Montreal, so I really can't say anything. Um, anyway, so you have 80 meters by 100 meters of collecting area, very similar to the GBT. Um, but what's different from the GBT is that these are cylinders, and along the axis of every cylinder are 256 antennas. They're all hang hanging there. Um, dual polarization feeds, and so you have a total of 1,024 feeds, each sensitive to two polarizations, so you have 2,048 input signals that are going into a massive correlator. It is the world's largest correlator. Um, we like to say that it's uh, handle it, the, the input data rate, which is 13 terabits a second, is comparable to the world's entire cellular network data rate. Uh, the correlator, half of it's located under the, um, you can't, you can't, there's a little hut there, receiver hut, and then also in these shipping containers on the side. Two of them are for part of the correlator, the other's for the FRB search engine. As I said, 400 to 800 megahertz, and what makes it amazing is that it has a huge field of view. Because it's a, a cylinder, it focuses in one dimension, and by the way, I forgot to say these are oriented north-south. The long axis is exactly north, so the sky rotates overhead. There's no moving parts. It's a transit telescope. So the sky just rotates overhead. It doesn't focus in the north-south direction. It's like a mirror in the north-south direction. So in the east-west direction, it focuses, and you get a beam that's a couple degrees wide, depending on what radio frequency, because it's a factor of you know, large bandwidth. North-south, you get 120 degrees field of view. So it's a, about 200 square degrees field of view. So this is enormous compared to a single dish radio telescope where it's a few arc minute field of view. So it's a huge leap. Uh, the beam size is um, tens, tens of arc minutes, half a degree. Um, this was all built with money from the Canada Foundation for Innovation, a total of about $20 million. Uh, and you can read more about it at this, at this website. This is the team, the CHIME Fast Radio Burst team. Uh, so it's researchers at McGill, at University of British Columbia in Toronto, um, University of Toronto. And uh, one thing I really want to point out is there's many students, graduate students and postdocs. That, this is student and postdoc run. They are doing huge heroic work. Um, and uh, this, this project would not be happening without the students and postdocs. There's very few professional staff. There are a few programmers that we have and a couple project managers who are fantastic, um, but it's the students. And just for scale, there's this part of the CHIME FRB team standing um, uh, in, in one of the cylinders. So just it's a, it's a very large structure. So how does this work? Um, if you had a single feed on one cylinder, you would see one large swath of sky north-south, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish a source that was here from a source that's there. Okay? If you put a whole bunch on one cylinder and you do, do a Fourier transform, you think of it like a kind of like a diffraction grating, you can form beams. Uh, basically, your correlator effectively is adding the necessary delays, and you keep track of all of these different positions. So if you have a here we've drawn just a few, but if you have 256, you get 256 north-south beams. And if you also have four cylinders, 
then you get four east-west and 256 north-south beams. So you have 1,024 independent beams on the sky. You effectively have 1,024 green bank telescopes operating 24-7, doing nothing but looking for FRBs. A very, very powerful. Um, and and that, that's just a cartoon. If you actually draw, you, you have to just realize that there's lots of tiny little beams. There's a thousand of them, it's, it's a lot. And in fact, when you do the algorithms for FFT beam forming, you find there's interesting things, and you could write, I'm sure a whole thesis could get written about this. You know, the beams at, at exactly the zenith are nice and circular, and the beams near the edges are kind of elliptical very frequency dependent, the extents of them. That's, these are all things that we're learning and, and, and trying to deal with at the moment. So are yeah. you operating each beam? That's the purpose. Each beam, you want them to be independent? Or are you going to try and actually we, So, so they're, they're close packed. And they're each looking at separate positions on the sky. Okay. Um, and you want that because you would like to, uh, for a tra so for transients, when you don't want to do fast radio burst science, you don't know where the next one's going to be. You want a large field of view. But you also want to know roughly where it came from. And so a really bright FRB will end up in the side lobes of neighboring beams. So, um, so you, want, you want all those beams. But what that means is you have to process and search for millisecond pulses at unknown dispersion measures a thousand, for a thousand beams in real time. This is a very high performance computing. That, that's why we have, uh, okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So um, four cylinders, they go into, it's an FX style correlator. I, I won't discuss, the F engine is part of this correlator, was built by Professor Matt Dobbs at McGill University. And then it goes into these, next door shipping containers, the X part of the correlator, which is built at the University of Toronto by Professor Keith Vanderlyn. And then all of the data um, are used for the cosmology hydrogen mapping experiment, for fast radio burst searching, and also we have a pulsar instrument that can study pulsars 24-7, all at the same time. So you can do all of this at the same time. And you can make predictions for how many FRBs Chime should be able to find. Uh, this is Pragya Chala made this plot. Um, you have a large field of view, so this is now bursts per hour and observing frequency. And you can see the different experiments. And, and the most important thing is detected bursts per hour. You want to be far on the right side of this plot because that means you'll detect a lot of them. And you can see Chime really stands apart from all other current and planned FRB detection instruments because of our enormous detection rate. Now, this was what we were predicting, but of course, there's all the uncertainties that I measured. They could be scattered away, and this is scattering time, assuming uh, a millisecond at 1.4 gigahertz. You could, they could be totally scattered away in the chime band. They could be absorbed. There's spectra. We know that we weren't detecting anything at 350 megahertz, so it's a bit of an unknown. Um, we have a large detection pipeline. Um, this is the chime view of the sky. This is how we view the sky. This is time on the x-axis, and this is north-south beam number on the y-axis, so that this is 60 degrees from zenith in the south, and this is 60 degrees from zenith in the north. And what you can see are these horizontal lines. Those are radio pulsars uh, because they drift in and they drift out. And so the, the horizontal lines are telltale. Those are radio pulsars. These, and, and you can verify their, what their dispersion measure is because we have this real-time pipeline that is constantly searching. So, we, so the galactic radio pulsars are our annoying foregrounds because some of them burst, you know, 10 times a second, and they transit. You just get thousands of bursts. It's annoying. Like it, we, we, so we have logic set up in the pipeline to ignore galactic radio pulsars. Unless it's interesting, then we can tell it, no, no, don't ignore them. Um, this is pulsar, the brightest pulsar in the northern sky, pulsar 0329 plus 54. You can see 
it actually, we see it for quite a long time, which tells you our telescope has pretty broad side lobes, which is something to think about what that means. But uh, these vertical stripes that happen in a few seconds, those are airplanes crossing overhead. So actually an undergraduate student, uh, uh, Charles Moati, who figured out that it was airplanes, and we weren't expecting to see airplanes uh, in this band, and we're still kind of curious why they are, but he matched the pattern of vertical lines to the flight pattern at Penticton Airport. Very curious. Anyway, I'm happy to tell you that we have started detecting FRBs with chime, and this is the Valentine's Day cover of Nature, Space, and Chime. Very clever. Uh, where we announced the detection during a pre-commissioning phase when the telescope was not, in fact, we're still commissioning, the telescope is, was nowhere near design sensitivity, we reported the detection of 13 FRBs, um, and here they are, and some of them go all the way down to 400 megahertz easily. I'll get there. Um, you can see... Uh, yeah, some go all the way down to 400 megahertz. So any question about absorption or scattering, and some are scattered. Uh, look at this one. That's really scattered, beautiful scattering. But they're not all scattered. Uh, so that was very exciting. It means the phenomenon exists in our band, and uh, we can study it. Of the first 13, one is a repeater. So we found the second known repeater. Totally excited by that. And what are the chances? So we could go back and you say there were... Parks found so many, and then ASCAP has found, like, different groups have found lots of, nobody else has found repeater. Chime in its first 13 finds a repeater. And I'll just tell you, we have more repeaters. We have more repeaters. What? I was just kidding. I said, you repeat, you have more repeaters. Yes, that's right. I repeat, I repeat. We re yes. Um, and you can see five bursts from the second repeating source. Um, interestingly, the dispersion measure of this one's only 189, although much greater than the galactic maximum. So it's a much closer repeater than the Arecibo repeater. What it means is we'll be able to look for multi-wavelength, but we haven't localized it yet. It hasn't cooperated during interferometric observations. Um, uh, what else do I want to tell you? Um, spectra? Well, you, so... The spectra, you have to look at chime spectra with a massive grain of salt. We have not calibrated our bandpass, and that is actually very, very challenging to do. I have newfound respect for circular apertures. When you have a crazy cylindrical aperture, uh, interesting things, multi many, many bounces. You don't, um, it's not like radiation comes and goes right to a feed. Ding, 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 you get resonances, you get all sorts of interesting spectral features, but nevertheless, we do believe that the variety of spectra that you're sort of looking at indicates the source genu genuinely is spectrally variable, but we can't quantify it well. And this is something we're working on very hard, and it's a hard problem, I have to tell you. Um, but what was interesting, um, just very quickly, how much time do I have? I don't have a lot of time, so let me quick, I'm going to skip that. You can ask me about it. So basically, this is now the sky. Um, we're now opening up the northern sky to FRBs. Parks is in the southern hemisphere. Uh, until recently, most FRBs have been in the south. Parks can't, uh, uh, Chime can't see below about minus 11 declination. Um, so you can see the Chime FRBs, um, finally some in the very north. Uh, now, that, those were the first 13 that we've already published that were from a pre-commissioning phase last July and August, and, and we have been running since then, and I'm very happy to show you some very preliminary results. Uh, so we are detecting lots and lots of fast radio bursts. Uh, we do have several hundred at this point, and uh, it is... Um, this is an interesting plot. It's not corrected for exposure. If you plot it, uh, no. <laughs> um, you notice. I won't tweet it. I will only put it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I know you would too. So I'm going to say, don't. Please do not. Please do not tweet. Um, um, but here is a plot in galactic coordinates, and you might think, oh, there's clustering 
of the fast radio burst, but don't get too excited. That is the North Celestial Pole, where Chime has tremendous exposure. Um, the North Celestial Pole is significantly above our horizon. For sources in this region, we actually detect it not at the, only at the primary transit, but at the secondary transit, because the North Celestial Pole is above. So if it goes around the pole, you get ding, and then you get ding. So we have tons of exposure in this region. And by the way, the repeater that I presented was a declination um, plus 73. And um, generally speaking, we, as I said, we have other repeaters. I didn't bring any plots with me, but they tend to be at high declination, mainly because we have tons of exposure there. Um, so this is a bit of a montage of our FRBs now. Uh, Ziggy Plenis, PhD student, pre prepared this montage, and we are working our way through this data. It is actually, uh, uh, it's like drinking from a fire hose. We are trying to develop the algorithms to band pass calibrate and to measure, um, you know, distributions of flu fluences and distributions of widths and distributions of dispersion measures, while at the same time correcting for biases inherent in our pipeline. It is, it is a very large challenge. I'm sure you're, some of you are quite familiar with these sorts of things. And we're working at it, and you will hear more soon. But is the number roughly consistent with expectations from previous rate estimates and sensitivity? And roughly speaking, yes. Okay. So you knew this was coming? Well, we didn't. I mean, there were people who questioned whether we would detect anything. They said, oh, they'll all be scattered. And we do have quite a few that are scattered. Like, uh, uh, um, you know, we didn't know the spectra in advance, but, but we bargained. I mean, we, we bargained. But you probably would see more if you had it at high frequencies. If you could have the same field of view at high frequencies, maybe your rate would be higher. And so the big question is, what is our rate compared to 1.4 gigahertz? And that we're working on. We don't... It's, it's, not, it's non trivial to measure a proper rate. Mm -hmm. When you don't know, for example, when you can see 0329 for hours before and after transit, that tells you you're seeing a very large part of the sky, not just your beam. You have side lobes. And so you have to quantify those very hard with a transit telescope. Anyway, conclusions FRBs are here to stay. Their origin remains unknown. Um, maybe they all repeat. And you just have to be patient, and you have to have a s telescope that is systematically looking at the sky every day, like Chime does. Uh, the first localization has been accomplished, and a cosmological distance is confirmed. We now have a second source, and we are working on it. And incidentally, I encourage you to invite somebody from ASCAP, although the travel budget needs to be higher. Um, they have, they are, have localized three more, apparently. And I don't want to steal their thunder, but over coffee, I'm happy to tell you what they've talked about at conferences. And um, uh, you know, we were it suggested this range was interesting, but Chime is clearly a great um, detection machine. And um, here's a picture of some of the people who are involved. And I'm very grateful to funding agencies and all the people who work so hard on this project. And I will leave you with a drone flyby of Chime. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so um, w w we have, we have uh, a few hundred, and we see, we also see, so there's a, a class of source in the galaxy called a rotating radio transient, which we think, a rat, which uh, is like a radio pulsar, but it's very intermittent and only emits single pulses occasionally, and we detect lots of rats. Um, and we definitely we, we see a range of dispersion measures. Our, our highest dam right now is 3,000, but we see FRBs that are consistent with being outside of the galaxy all the way down to DM of 100. Uh, is, is that, does that mean it's is that still extragalactic? So there are some sources 
where the DM is just a little bit more than the model predicts. And then you go, oh, what if the model were a little bit wrong? And so those you puzzle over. And um, we have a couple like that that we're, we're working on, like looking with multi-wavelength telescopes, looking, maybe there's an H2 region right along that line of sight that's giving enhanced galactic DM and we didn't know it, or on the other hand, if it really is extra galactic and it's so close, there better be a galaxy there. And so even though we don't localize very well, you can still say something about what galaxies are there. Is, is there a really close galaxy? So these are the sorts of things we're doing, and we have quite a number of those sources. So, so what, what's your plan for localization? So you need to go, you, I mean, your data is within your collaboration. But you can't localize. All those repeaters? Yeah. Yeah, so repeaters, we definitely want community help to localize. So, how do you do that? With MOUs, or you're just going to rely on getting hundreds of hours of VLA time or VLBI? No. So, the plan was to have MOUs, and I even s sent out an email to a large group of people. Um, saying we were willing to give you the coordinates of our repeaters in advance of publication, although we're also obviously working on a paper. Um, and everybody got really excited. And then we realized that um, our localizations were not quite right. Um, you know, when you have a side lobe detection, sometimes it's a side lobe detection. And so you don't want to tell everybody, look there, when it's really there. And so you have to do this right. And so right now, there's a bit of a holding pattern while we sort ourselves out. And it could be that the time between when we sort it out and when we publish it is so small that the MOUs will be silly and everybody can just follow them up. But we are definitely going to publish them long before we try and localize them you're ourselves. Not, uh, that's uh, my next question. You're not going to hold up until you localize them? No, that would take, f so we're working on a paper with many more repeaters. Look, this, we can't do it ourselves. It's, it's hard. We, for, for our two, for the second repeater, we put in some proposals. But, you know, there's lots of telescopes on the planet. We can't do all of them. We definitely want people to, to help follow up. Do you have the Arecibo repeater in the field of view? Yes. Have you seen it? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I didn't. I didn't talk about that, but but that we have t discussed it. We we've seen one one event from it. Um, so it's interesting that to us to chime, it's not a repeater, which is interesting because what it's telling you is that. Uh, um, you know, you, you, Arecibo is a very sensitive telescope. So there could be lots of repeaters there that you just can't detect. Yeah. So the fact that ASCAP didn't detect any repeaters in their 20 events that they published recently, which I didn't get to talk about, but um, I don't think it means none of them is a repeater. I just think you need very sensitive follow-up telescopes to be sitting on each of them. And unfortunately, they're in the south and we're in the north. And we were at a meeting together and we're like, oh, we can't look at any of your sources. It's so annoying. Anyway, build, yeah, so Hyrax. So I didn't talk about that, but there is a plan to build a, a sister chime in South Africa, although using dishes and not cylinders. That's John, John Seaver's um, project. Uh, it's also built to map redshift at H1, um, but eventually that will happen. Uh, sorry if I misunderstood this, but from the first measurement of the Arecibo repeater, it seemed like morphologically it looked quite different than the ones from before. And from the non-repeaters that you've detected since then, does it still stand out? Do the other repeaters stand out? Because that would kind of indicate that these are separate physical phenomena that yeah. are going yeah. on. Yeah, you're, 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 you're exactly right. And the answer is um, maybe. Okay. So this is the chime repeater. And you notice interesting structure in some of the repeats from the chime repeater. Um, and if you notice, there's this, so these have all been de-dispersed to the best of our ability. And actually, there's now an interesting question if you've de-dispersed it exactly right, because how you define the criteria for your optimal DM. Now, Matt, now, we, we never used to worry about this. If you just have a single Gaussian pulse, very clear, maximize your signal to noise ratio, that gives you the optimal DM. But if you have all these funky shapes and you, dis you, you, you disperse it to one DM and you get, you know, one peak blurs out, the other, 
other pig de- doesn't. Um, but we have an alg- we have algorithms that we think de disperse them properly. And you can see there's still this interesting structure that remains. And I, I skipped this slide, but what we noticed in, in our Nature paper um, announcing the second repeater is that there's this drifting. Remaining. This drifting remains after the best dispersion, and it goes downward in frequency. There's a drift rate. And this is this is R1, this is the Arecibo repeater. That exact same phenomenon, this downward drifting, was also seen there. Now, you might say, okay, therefore, repeaters have complicated pulse shapes and downward drifting, because two of them have done the same thing. Among the many chime bursts we have, we do see others like this that have not repeated. Now, maybe that means maybe they will. They <laughs> maybe they are. And so we're sort of tempted to write proposals to look at those with Arecibo or with GBT, where you can s- stare at it and not get only your 15 minutes a day. But you don't want to bias yourself, right? Because maybe even just so, so sometimes, the, sometimes the R1 just has a single pulse. So can it could be. Speak? local PMs and plasma that's just rapidly moving around? Or at the source? At the source? Yeah. So, so uh, Jim Cordes uh, has a plasma lensing models that um, try and reproduce um, both the strange spectral structure, where there's clearly it peaks in the band, and um, the strange time structure. And his model can actually reproduce many of the strange phenomena that we see, but it would predict as much downward drifting as upward drifting. Mm -hmm. And we haven't yet seen any upward drifting in any of the R1 of the Arecibo repeater events, and also in R2, and I, so far, not in anything. Downward is dispersion, right? Well, but this this is not 1 over F squared dispersion. I have one question. Uh, can you place some constraint on on these models by looking at the rotation measure? Yes. Because you have also, if you have polarization, you could should be able to get something, a product of the magnetic field and the electron densities, and perhaps you could place some constraint. So you're asking with with chime or in general for with FRB? Chime. Um, so with chime, um, yeah. So I I I skipped over a lot about chime that I, I could tell you. Um, Basically, chime, ta- chime our, our search engine that's searching for FRB searches on intensity data. So we throw away the polarization information for detection. Once we make it, but we're, we're buffering the data. We buffer it constantly. And so when the real-time search engine detects an event, we do a baseband callback. Oh, okay. We go back and uh, quickly, because the buffer is getting overwritten, we, so we have this down to a few seconds latency, two to three seconds. Our real-time pipeline has to find the FRB, otherwise we lose the baseband data, but then we can dump the baseband data and do polarization. And the system um, is now working, actually. In the last few months, we've gotten that working, and we do have baseband data from several F- for several FRBs, so once including some detect- repeaters. And once you have a detection, you save the data, you keep them. So you can yeah, them. and the baseband data are voluminous. Uh, so we we have um, uh, we, you know a deal with Compute Canada. They're going to store our data, uh, but you have to transfer it, and the fastest transfer rate is disks on a truck. But that's what we do. So the dispersion and the rotation measures should really tell you something about whether the plasma is actually in the vicinity of the source or is it further away. Right. So that's what I was trying to imply. Yes, for yeah. Okay. So for the one for R one, the rotation measure is enormous, ten to the five, um, which is thought to be at the source, because the galactic contribution to that rotation measure is tiny. But um, other telescopes have been able to measure polarization in other FRBs, and the story is very complicated. 
the first repeaters pulses are 100% linearly polarized, but there are FRBs that have been detected to be to have very little polarization, almost zero. And others where there has been detection of polarization, they measure rotation measures that are consistent with the galactic rotation measure. <laughs> so the story with polarization is complicated. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, uh, yeah. I feel like the repeater having 10 to the 5 is a clue. But then others don't have anywhere near that. They don't have an interesting rotation measure at all. It's all from the galaxy. So, are you willing to tell us something about the second repeater and polarization of it? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I I don't think we have baseband data for R two. We have baseband data for other repeaters that we haven't published yet. No, I can't tell you about that yet. We're still analyzing the data. Yeah, I know that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Should we review? I'm also hungry now, so let's uh, let's time to speak for a break.